to bully your opponent around with a heavy, heavy topspin forehand, stay right here. My name is Micah Babble. I'm a former top 30 WTA pro. I played in 19 main draws of Grand Slam tournaments. And I am showing you today how you get more topspin, more power on your forehand. If you want to support my channel, please subscribe. Recommend it to some of your tennis friends if you like my content and make sure you click that little bell symbol because then you know when I'm putting new content out. Now there's a lot of talk about the lag and snap and the contact point and all kinds of stuff, but here's how I learned it. Here's how I got it from coaches that train world-class players, including me, but also Grand Slam champions and Olympic gold medalists. So here is what they taught me. It is all in the preparation. If you cannot get your preparation right, the contact point, the follow through, they're all just consequences and they're not going to give you the most effective ball that you can possibly hit. So I always liken it when I talk to my clients to writing a word. If you misspell the first letter, it doesn't matter what you do for the rest of the word, it's going to be wrong. So let's look at the forehand preparation and where you build the foundation to get massive topspin. Now, when we're seeing top players, a lot of times we're just looking at all of this here because it's the fastest that's happening. It's you know what we think we see as the key to getting good topspin on the ball. And of course, you're getting good acceleration on the ball if you're just using your arm. But what if you could magnify the effect that you have with your arm by using your larger muscle groups. And that is where we're going to start. So what we're focusing on is really great preparation. So I want to use my larger muscle groups. I want to use my quad, my ham, my glutes, and then let that energy travel up to then lastly get into my swing, my contact and my follow through. So what you see a lot is this stance semi-open stance. That is now the preferred stance for forehands at the baseline. Are there still closed stance opportunities? Absolutely. I was taught a closed stance. It was racket down and back, contact out to the side of the body because the grips were not as aggressive yet, and then you follow through here and you caught your racket here. This is a linear motion, right? So it goes from A to be in pretty much a straight line. Now, with better equipment, better strings, frames that can support those aggressive swings, we're now seeing a lot more topspin. We see more aggressive grips. But whatever grip you have, you can still put the components in that give you more topspin. So what we're now using really is more an angular motion. What that means it's a rounder motion. So think of yourself, your body as the axis and everything travels around that axis. You can generate a lot more power that way because you can use your legs a lot better. So how do you use them? In a semi open stance, I want to load on my outside leg on my right leg for me because I'm a right hander and I'll show you from the back in a second too. What I'm doing is I'm getting behind the ball and I dip down. Now all my energy is stored here. And that is what I'm gonna use to then push off of, off the ground here and continue with a rounder motion. The second thing that you see is that my lower body is not disconnected from my upper body. I want a good turn. This whole thing is called the unit turn because you turn as a unit. And in good players, so I just did a video about Casper Root's forehand. You see, I'm going to get rid of this ball, that they do have the racket hand out here, left hand, off hand, is connected. But when they separate, the left hand is still past my midline. And of course, what that does is it gives me a really good coil. So I really feel that I'm really powerful here right now. I feel a stretch here. And I can lower down. I'm not too worried about how you bring your racket back. That is very individual to you and your grip. The grip demands the swing path and the swing path demands the contact point. So don't worry about your grip. I'm going to make other videos about that. 
But what I usually teach is an Eastern forehand grip. That means you have the underside of your, under, uh, the underside of your index finger knuckle and your heel pad on bevel number three. One, two, three, or a semi-Western. And that is on bevel number four. Now, during my career, I moseyed over to a semi-Western grip. I was taught in a Eastern forehand grip and then I see pictures of myself being more under the grip. And that is all because the game got faster, the game got heavier. So let's combine the two. So this is my position when I'm behind the ball. I have my chin on my shoulder. I wanna be that far around. Now you do see various variations on, is my racket face pointing to you? Is it a little more closed? You have somebody like Alexander Zverev, who's all the way down here. Then you have somebody like Kasper Ruud, who's a little bit more here. Those are variations that we're not going to worry about in this video. What we are worrying about is this position here. And this is where it's going to get interesting. So a couple of key points here. I want to have the racket face below my wrist so that I drop below the ball. If I'm still up here, when I'm starting to drop my racket, it's going to get really difficult to get under the ball. Now, I'm going to use the terminology of Dr. Mark Kovac. This is my lock-in position. This concludes my preparation, my take back, my loading. And from now on, all the energy that I created with my legs travels forward and up to your contact point. Now let's take a second to talk about the wrist lag. I hear a lot of lag and snap. Now I trained with other world-class players. I trained with world-class coaches. I was never taught a lag and snap. And here's why. If you hold your racket relaxed enough, this position here will occur naturally. I'm using a force, my hand, to pull forward. So I'm having the racket being pushed here and the weight of the racket back here on the tip of the racket lags back. And I show you from a different angle as well. Okay, so here's the same principle again. You see that I'm pushing onto the grip and you see that the tip of the racket stays back. So I'm literally just using my little pinky here and you see how much force is to just move the grip and the tip of the racket stays back. So that's your wrist lag explained. If you hold on too much to the grip, that could happen then that you're not ever getting into this position. And by focusing on it, I'm focusing on my wrist too much here, I'm gonna tense up. So ideally, just try to hold on to this so that you can wobble around. That's, that's loose enough. I'm not gonna uh, do this. So when I teach a lot of times, I'm saying, try not to have the knuckles of death. And what that means is you're holding on so tightly that I see white in your knuckles. So no knuckles of death. So this happens naturally. As I'm now getting the energy up from my legs, traveling through my hips here, the hips start to come forward. And now the weight of my racket starts to catch up with my hand. So my racket face, the tip of my racket face here, catches up to my hand. At this point, my hand is really very loose. I'm not gonna try to dictate anything in the one to two thousandths of a second that my racket makes contact with the ball. That's impossible. I'm pretty good, but I'm not that good. So again, I let that hand catch up to my contact point, and now, is where it gets juicy. We're just gonna do this from the front so you see it better. So again, I'm in my load, and now I'm letting that energy travel forward. Now, if I'm just lightly pushing, I'm not doing much here, into the inside of my racket, you see that my wrist is now laid back. Again, I'm coming under the, the ball with my racket face below wrist. Now, the racket head has caught up with my hand. I want to have my contact point out in front, and not too far out so that I get my entire right side in because this all stays connected. And again, if I'm loose enough, the energy travels up from my legs, through my hips, 
up through my torso here, chest, and then into the arm. And now when you see this finish, you see the angular movement. This is my axis. I let everything travel around this axis. Let's talk about what I think is actually way more important than what you're doing with the wrist at contact point. We can't see that with the human eye. My camera is not even good enough to have as many frames that I can see that when I slow that down. So what we can control though is this entire swing path. And if I start with the proper preparation to get into my lock-in position here, and then I focus on my finish here, I can replicate what one of my friends calls the rainbow. She's teaching little kids. This is not necessarily a German thing, um, that we have the beginning of the rainbow. I'm riding on the rainbow here, and then I get to my pot of gold. There's two key points here. I want to see the butt cap facing away from me, and I want to see the side of the racket with which I just hit point outside. If you just do this with your hand, you see that the hand here points to the outside or down. Those are individual things that different players have in different stages here. But what is the same, again, is that lock-in position. And then I wave goodbye. So those are the components that you can control. And it doesn't matter what level you are. If you're relaxed enough, and I'll show you a couple of drills for all these stages, you will be able to get massive topspin onto your forehand. A few more words about the finish. The finish really depends on what kind of ball you're getting and what you want to do with the ball. Don't follow the, you always have to follow through over your shoulder. Now there's Daniel Medvedev who kind of wraps his racket around his head two times, how he does it, no idea. But even he has different finishes. So for instance, if you want to hit a short angle, you're probably not gonna finish here. You're going to finish here. If the ball comes a little heavier, one of these heavier topspin balls that you want to avoid, you wanna do that to other players, you might be a little late and then just do this. One of the things that one great coach that I had when I was little taught me was that your swing path here demands what the flight path of the ball is. So if I'm back behind the baseline, I can flatten my strokes out because I have a lot of room to hit into. I need the shape of that rainbow then probably when I'm further inside the court because I'm closer up to net and I have less room to hit into. So make sure that you understand where you are in the court and what you want to do with that ball. And that really predicts what kind of finish you have. Let's look at the function of the hip when we hit those balls. So what you're seeing now is that the right leg in that semi-open stance, after it releases its load and has basically unloaded all the energy into the swing, into the ball, the right hip comes around. A couple of words of caution there is what you don't want to do is rip that hip forward. All of it is connected. So even if you're not hitting very hard, I can work on having my right side connected in all the elements and let it come around that axis. And of course, when you're now watching a little bit closer, a lot of times you're seeing people lifting off the ground so that literally both of their legs are in the air. Again, that is coming from the ground. They're not just deliberately jumping, it's coming from the load and then really using the ground force to get into the ball with that angular movement. All right, now that we're through all of the explanations, let's get into the drills because I don't want to leave you hanging high and dry. And my friend, my co-coach here at Gates Tennis Center in Denver, Connor, is going to help us out because he's a lot stronger than me. He does it a lot better than me. 
So the first thing that we're going to do is we're working on the proper loading. This is probably not enough for Connor. If we look at Google and you just Google world-class tennis player workouts, you see that they're heaving around eight, nine, 10 pounds. This is two pounds, but just for the purpose here. So what you're trying to do is really catch that ball and let that pull you into a deep load. And then you're releasing and you can already start working with staggering that step here and then releasing that right hip. All right, don't blow me away. There we go. So come through with your right hip. There we go. Perfect. Good. Excellent. And you saw that it took us a couple of seconds there to really coordinate that. Of course, you can do that against the wall, but a partner drill is awesome. Um, what did you feel what the ball did? I really felt like the ball started to get me in the right position. I felt the weight push back, so I really felt the load up on that back leg. And then when I went to explode forward, all the power was coming from that back position. So the next drill that you can do is either with a partner or you can do that, for instance, against the fence and just have the, if I may, yep. just have the tip of the racket against the fence so that you have some resistance here when you pull forward. And what you're working on is just having the right side all connected and coming through and not spending a whole lot of focus on what your wrist is doing. So I'm asking Connor to drop into his ready position and I'm just gently pulling him here and then I let go and pull through. There we go and let that right hip come through. So you see that he's rotating around this axis. So I'm being meaner a little bit, pull and then see how that energy basically pulls you through. Do it a couple more times. Okay, and I'm also gonna be picky about the wrist here okay. being above your racket face. Okay. And then go. So another drill to really feel how connected your right side of your body should be and how you're really creating that energy and then releasing it is to use a little heavier, smaller ball. So this is more the shape of a lentil these days. It's two pounds. And what I want to work on is Again, the weight of the ball will pull your wrist back here and then working on releasing it and not paying attention. Okay, so what we're working on is, <laughs> are you ready, Connor? I'm ready. Is that I'm rolling the ball to him. And again, I want to finish here with the outside or the inside, sorry, the palm of the hand facing to my outside. So we can do that again as a partner drill, or we can do it against a wall if we're by ourselves. Again, we're working on a semi-open, and I just let my arm roll through. Uh-oh. Okay, and if we're doing this a little faster with more energy, oh! <laughs> Let's be careful of the camera here. Don't do that. So here's another drill. And um, yeah, let's see if we can do that without hurting ourselves. I'm just gonna drop feed the balls. And because there is an obstacle here really close to Connor, he really has to work on letting that racket head dip very low. The lower you let the racket head dip and steeper you brush, the more of rotation you get on the ball. So let's um, try this. There we go, nice. Good. Up and let that right hip come through. Good. And since you're closer inside the court, you really have to get the ball up quickly. And yeah. because of you give it so much um, rotation, the ball stays in, hopefully. All right, four more. Nice. Good. Racket head drops. Good. One more. Good. Now, if you don't have a coach that can drop feed you those balls, Connor, just go ahead and drop feet yourself and let's see how that goes. Nice. Good. What did you feel? Any difference? Yeah, I felt a difference um, from after we did the weighted exercises. I felt how much, like, like the heaviness of what the racket should feel like. And yeah. as soon as I went to accelerate it, also I could feel that looseness as well. Nice. Like how important it was to stay relaxed, but also maintain that feeling that um, just a little bit of weight in my hand so I can yeah. stay loose and rotate. And that, letting the racket drop down before you brush really, really helps a lot. Good. All right. Have fun. 
trying out those exercises, let me know in the comments how they went, and we'll see you in the next video.